very much. Wow. Oh. Obama. Yes, Peter. This is Peter Florence, by the way, who runs the festival. He's one of the great men of British festival life. He's been running this festival for years and years and years. He's a great man. Peter Florence. Um, yes, Obama. I, I'm, someone, someone asked me once, is Obama the Messiah? Which is an interesting question. <laughs> peculiar one. Um, but uh, that's the kind of intensity that his election, or even his candidature, uh, elicited, isn't it? People really were so excited by the idea of Obama. Um, he's not the Messiah. Mind you, personally, I don't think the Messiah is the Messiah either, so that's a little <laughs> confusing. But um, I'll, I'll start with a story, Peter, if I may. Um, I happened to be in Kenya during the run-up to the actual election in November. I was in Madagascar when the... Uh, the actual day of the polling took place, but I was in Kenya and uh, I was filming there, and this is the place, of course, whence uh, Obama's father uh, 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 derived, and I thought, gosh, I'd be jolly excited that uh, the son of Kenyan soil will soon be the most powerful man on earth, and I was speaking to an elder of a particular tribe where we were filming uh, rhinoceroses, as it happens, and I said, uh, is it very exciting um, that Obama is quite clearly going to become president. He said, we are very, very pleased. And I said, um, yeah, the first black president of the United States. He said, uh, you should remember one thing. If he had stayed in Kenya and been the president of Kenya, he would have been our first white president. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's a great lesson in perspective. It's one of the most peculiar and unspoken facts of our very skewed, embarrassed, and uh, hysterical view of race is that we can't really confess the fact that if a white person has a 16th black in them, they're called black, but if a black person has a half white in them, they're called black. It's very odd. Anyway, that's a, a whole other issue. Yes, I, I think, personally, um, and of course at a literary festival one imagines one speaks with one voice, but there may be many people dissenting, but I think Really, and I'll include the second term of Clinton and the two terms of Bush, was a time at which it, America's stock ran very, very low in the world and amongst people like myself, revolting as we may be, uh, or people like yourselves, charming as you may be. There was, you know, there are two sides, if you like, to America. I'm sure there are many more sides, but if, if we want to be simplistic. One of those sides is... Um, a, a, a rampant, rabid corporatism, red in tooth and claw, is a fundamental religion, is an, a social atomism, a, a refusal to believe in society that leaves Margaret Thatcher standing. Uh, individuality, um, any kind of government inter intervention or government help for any kind of people is called socialising, which is the biggest curse. There's that side of America in which the word liberal is an insult. And over the last almost, I would say, certainly 10 years before Obama, we kind of forgot that America could mean anything else. That's what America meant. It meant that attitude. Add to it what we perceive to be an ignorance about the rest of the world, a, a complete lack of understanding or knowledge or imaginative penetration of the cultures and societies of uh, Asia and Europe and uh, uh, Africa. And that's what America became. It became a laughing stock for bien pensant like ourselves, for right thinking, decent, intelligent, educated, liberal people, uh, uh, with the smallest of L's, I'm sure. Um, and so America, as I say, became a kind of laughing stock, a kind of um, hate figure amongst the nations of the world. And the, the rise of Obama reminded us that I think all of us in our hearts are predisposed to love America, not America as it is, but the idea of America. Which of us have not seen Frank Capra movies that quote the uh, 
the, the Declaration of Independence. Which of us don't hear the Star Spangled Banner and think, ah, you know, kitsch as America is, there's something absolutely noble about such idealism, about such belief in self-improvement and advancement and hope. All these qualities which in Britain we tend to put so far down, we tamp down inside our embarrassed selves. And Obama reminded us that there is an upside to America, a genuine upside, a country that is founded in revolution and founded in the, a bill of rights, founded in belief in equality and purpose and uh, opportunity. And, uh, and so there was a genuine excitement at the idea that maybe the Americans had not lost it. It gave us permission in the jargon to love America as we really want to love America. But my submission, I suppose, would be, and it's hardly an original observation, all politics ends in failure. It's not an original remark, but it needs to be remembered. All politics ends in failure. All political lives are through back doors scowling, and probably if death doesn't come first, then comes 10 or 15 years of bitter and resentful memoiring, um, <laughs> in which records are apparently set straight, and it was all somebody else's fault, and they were never understood for the good they did. It's all... It's all bitter. I've met so many retired politicians, and they're all unhappy. We could come to the whole business of politics later. But anyway, you said Obama, and I started on a 10-minute journey. But that, that was my feeling about Obama. But on the one hand, the positive good of, of, uh, of how he reminded us to love America or parts of America, because it'll always be an ambiguous relationship. But the other thing is I don't believe that his... If he has two terms, I don't believe the two terms will end on, on an up. No, no politicians ever did. But um, nonetheless, it's an exciting thought, though it makes us wonder whether we could ever have such a figure. What do you feel about his recovery of rhetoric? That's a really good question. I'm very excited by that. Uh, um, um, I wonder what rhetoric means. The, I think the, the standard definition of rhetoric is, uh, is the art of persuasion. It's the, the use of language to persuade. Um, my, my belief is that, generally speaking in Britain, we distrust anything if it is well expressed. If you wish to convince someone of the, like, the truth of how you really feel, then you should... I can't say... <laughs> Whereas if you express yourself in a well-modulated way, in an articulate way, in which you marshal the words that you wish to use in the right order, then it's like, he's lying. He's lying. <laughs> he's, uh, he's on top of his... Nah, nah, nah. So, <laughs> and I can understand that. I mean, it is... This, well, why would we... You know, Silver-tongued is a yeah, curse. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. It's, 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 there's something deceitful. And white man speak with forked tongue. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, the ability to penetrate the truth of a subject, to be inspired by it, and to use words, to bring language to bear. You know, we live in a culture in which uh, the image, whether it's a computer icon or a poster image or, or high art as an image, is quite well respected, if not revered, and in which music is given a full due prominence. And as someone who is unable to draw and unable to tap out a rhythm or hum out a tune, um, I have always felt hugely disadvantaged by our culture. On the other hand, since I was able first to hear hymns and read poems and have stories read to me, I have always been excited by language in a way that I have been surprised to find is quite uncommon. Um, I remember when I first saw... Anthony Asquith's film of uh, The Importance of Being Earnest, and Michael Dennison, who played Algernon, says, would you be in any way offended if I said that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection? And I, I, or I was too young, but I almost orgasmed. <laughs> I, I simply did not know that language could do this, that language could do what music does, that you know, what painting does, could uh, address not the intellectual cold part of one's mind, but could address the heart could make something inside one vibrate and resonate with sheer joy, with absolute pleasure. And later on, I discovered many other things in languages, as, 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 as we all do, those who love to read and poetry and so on. But one of the things, in terms of pure rhetoric, was Churchill. 